Welcome back to Biosignaling on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. All right, so we've had a common theme in all of our videos, not even in this playlist, but including this playlist, where if you've got a way to, to activate something, you should also have a way to deactivate it or inactivate it. We mentioned that if for the G proteins, to inactivate them, they have an intrinsic GTPase activity that turns the GTP into GDP, causing the G protein to become inactive, right? We have ways of, ways of upregulating genes, but also ways of downregulating them, or repressing their transcription. Well, another way in the context of biosignaling that we can actually regulate the activity of the pathway is through what's called desensitization. All right, so as we've seen many times throughout this playlist, Here's our beta adrenergic receptor, which is a type of G-protein coupled receptor. In this case, epinephrine binds to it and triggers dissociation of the alpha subunit of the G-protein from the beta and gamma subunits. Again, we've seen that a million times, and again, it's not shown here explicitly, but the alpha subunit's gone. All we have left here is the beta and gamma regulatory subunits. All right, now essentially what the G-protein beta and gamma subunits can do under certain conditions is they can recruit a protein called beta arrestin receptor kinase to the membrane and it will bind to the G-protein coupled receptor, the GPCR here. Okay? And you see this protein beta arrestin receptor kinase, I typically abbreviate it as BARC. Um, it's in blue there. And what BARC does is when it's recruited up here, it actually phosphorylates some serine residues on the cytoplasmic domain of the G-protein coupled receptor. You actually see a couple of phosphates added here on serine residues. And when that happens, that actually attracts another protein. So BARC goes away, but these phosphates on serines attract this orange protein, beta-arrestin, thus the name beta-arrestin pathway. What beta-arrestin does is it forms a complex with the G protein coupled receptor and through a mechanism that's not really shown here too much, beta arrestin facilitates endocytosis of this receptor into the cell. Okay, so you see here kind of a, here's a very, very, almost like a vesicle, okay, but you see the G protein coupled receptors, there's a couple of them in the membrane here, okay. Now, once it's in this little vesicle, the beta arrestin can dissociate. But what that effectively does is it pulls the receptor inside the cell. Now, consider that for the moment we're talking about this receptor right here where my mouse is that's been pulled inside the cell in the vesicle. If I've got epinephrine out here, can it bind to that receptor? Well, no, it can't. Because epinephrine's out here, it has to bind to the G-protein coupled receptor when it's in the membrane. But it's no longer in the plasma membrane, it's been pulled inside the cell. So there's no way epinephrine can bind to this, this uh, protein now that it's been endocytosed. And so what that does is it prevents epinephrine from exerting its action. That process is called desensitization. Okay, and it's actually a very important uh, property and has many implications in things like um, drug withdrawal. So, for example, um, a good example of this is people who are addicted to opioids. Um, one of the things that happens in opioids is what's called tolerance. And tolerance is actually, part of it has its root in desensitization. So, it, it turns out that opioids such as morphine, but also the, the um, the common prescription drugs, hydrocodone, oxycodone, all that stuff, they all bind to what's called an opioid receptor. It's actually the mu opioid receptor, which also is a G-protein coupled receptor, just like this one. So the mu opioid receptor has a certain amount of, that it exists in some membranes, okay? And when you start taking uh, opioids, such as hydrocodone or morphine or whatever, what happens is, is there's a lot of activity of the mu opioid receptor because the opioid binds to it. But over time, what happens is the beta arrestin receptor kinase and beta arrestin ultimately by this mechanism pull those mu opioid receptors into the cell. And so there's less mu opioid receptors in the membrane. So how do you now get the same desired effect of the opioid when there's less receptors? you take more of the opioid. So instead of taking whatever dose you were, you double it, or then you triple it later, and quadruple it, and so on and so forth, that's tolerance. 
That's actually how it works. You need more of the stimulus or the signal to elicit the same response because you've got these proteins, these G protein coupled receptors, in this case it's the mu opioid receptor, being pulled into the cell. Okay, and actually eventually these can actually be, if they're not, necess if they're not needed, they can actually be degraded over time, these proteins. And another thing that's not actually shown here is these can actually be pulled back into the membrane under other conditions, okay? But overall desensitization actually prevents a signal from acting indefinitely, particularly if you don't want it to. Um, this pathway of desensitization also has implications in smell. That's why if you walk into um, a house that has a certain smell when you first walk in and you notice it. If you stay there for 30 minutes, eventually you won't smell the smell anymore because um, the odorants that, are, that you're actually detecting through your nose are actually binding to G protein coupled receptors as well. And so they're actually being pulled in the membrane so that you don't actually notice it over time. You've been desensitized to that smell. Now desensitization based on these G protein coupled receptors is going to lead us to another layer of regulation in the cell and it's actually a way that insulin or RTKs can regulate G protein coupled receptors and it actually depends um, sort of on what the nature of the G protein coupled receptor is. In this case on the left, this G protein coupled receptor is going to be synergistic with insulin, meaning it has some of the same functions. Over here on the right, this G protein coupled receptor, which is the beta adrenergic receptor, is antagonistic in function to insulin. In fact, if you took an anatomy course, you'd actually learn that insulin and epinephrine actually do have antagonistic functions, most of which are antagonistic. So they would actually tend to cancel each other out. Let's first look at how insulin can actually be synergistic with a G protein coupled receptor. All right, so it turns out that remember when insulin causes the RTK units to dimerize, remember that happens, they dimerize, they become activated, they autophosphorylate each other. If you need more review on that, please go back and watch the RTK video. And they can activate proteins like IRS1. We already talked about that. But it turns out that the insulin receptor, these uh, tyrosine kinase units, can actually phosphorylate a tyrosine on the G protein coupled receptor. What that actually can do is that actually can recruit a protein called SHC to the G protein coupled receptor where it binds to this phosphotyrosine right here. And then it binds GRB2, NSOS, NRAS, and RAF. Hmm, where have we seen that before? Well, other than the SHC, we saw that in the tyrosine re receptor tyrosine kinase pathway, except for IRS1 was the one that activated GRB2 and SOS and RAS and RAF1. So here what's happening is the G protein coupled receptor, when it gets phosphorylated by the RTK, it actually binds SHC, but then it initiates the same cascade from there as we saw in the RTK cascade. We get activation of MEK, ERK and then alter gene expression, okay? And so that's the case of what happens when insulin is synergistic with the G protein coupled receptor. But what happens when insulin is antagonistic, meaning it has the opposite function as in the case of epinephrine and the beta adrenergic receptor? Well, what's gonna happen is, is that insulin receptor, its, its tyrosine kinase activity will still phosphorylate um, some tyrosine residues, but in addition, the IRS1 protein will lead to activation of another protein kinase called protein kinase B, which will then phosphorylate some serine residues also on the uh, cytoplasmic domain of the beta adrenergic receptor. This phosphorylation pattern, notice, is different than it is over here where we have synergism. This phosphorylation pattern that we see over here on the beta adrenergic receptor actually stimulates beta arrestin to come over here. Remember, beta arrestin is also attracted to phosphoserines. Remember, we talked about that. So it comes over here and causes internalization of the G protein coupled receptor. And so that is actually one mechanism by which insulin can counteract and cancel out the effect of any residual epinephrine. Okay, because the beta adrenergic receptors are stimulated to become desensitized and endocytosed into the cell. All right, which again adds another layer of complexity to the regulation and crosstalk between these two receptor classes. All right, so hopefully this talk of desensitization made a little bit of sense and we added a little bit of extra regulation here. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.